What is up everybody? My name is Jeremy and welcome to the channel. And today we're going to be counting down the top 10 fighters in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. Now I know top 10 lists like this are incredibly hard to nail down, especially with a property like A Song of Ice and Fire as there are a countless number of incredibly good fighters in this story. But I'm going to do my best to try and count down my top 10 fighters. And I would love to know what your top 10 fighters are as well. Definitely let me know down in the comment section below after the video. And I would love to see where we compare and where we differ on the list. And don't forget to slap a like on this video and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our upcoming content that we'll be releasing while we wait for Season 2 of House of the Dragon to come around. Along with weekly live streams every Sunday night covering everything from the show... Winds of Winter, and many of the Song of Ice and Fire adaptations that are in pre-production. So without further ado, here is my top 10 fighters in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. Starting our list off at number 10, we have Sandor Clegane, a.k.a. The Hound. Sandor was born in 270 AC and was the sworn shield of Prince Joffrey Baratheon. Nicknamed the Hound for his fierce nature and his unwavering loyalty to House Lannister and the three dogs featured on his family banner. Sandor was the second son of House Clegane and had an older brother by the name of Gregor, a.k.a. the Mountain. When they were children, Sandor received a very gruesome facial burn at the hands of his older brother, Gregor, when he pressed Sandor's face into the fire and held it there when he caught him playing with a toy that didn't belong to him. Ever since that, the Hound has hated not only his brother, but fire alike. The Hound would go on to join the Lannister army when his brother took control of House Clegane after the mysterious death of their father. He saw his first action in the Lannister army when Tywin Lannister sacked the city of King's Landing during Robert's Rebellion. He would later go on to become the sworn shield and protector of Prince Joffrey Baratheon, the crown prince and next in line to the throne. Overall, the Hound was an extremely formidable and fierce fighter, and a very imposing character as well. Jaime Lannister, one of the best fighters in the realm, highly regards Sandor as one of the strongest men he has ever seen. Up next, coming in at number 9, we have Jon Snow. Jon Snow was born in 283 AC and was raised the bastard son of Lord Eddard Stark, the Lord of Winterfell. John was raised at Winterfell among the rest of Ned Stark's trueborn children, but he was never told the identity of his mother. Catelyn Stark, Ned's wife and the Lady of Winterfell, deeply despised Jon Snow and did not hide it, which made a very tough upbringing for John in his younger years. So later on, when John turned 14, he could not wait to get away from Winterfell and away from Lady Catelyn Stark. So he joined the Night's Watch with his uncle Benjen, and just as he departs for the Wall, Ned promises to tell him about his mother the next time they meet. Unfortunately, though, Ned Stark ends up dying before him and Jon ever have a chance to see each other again. As a recruit of the Night's Watch, Jon quickly stood out among his peers, especially when it came to fighting. Jon was a very natural, gifted-born swordsman. And later, as a full-fledged member of the Night's Watch, he would go on many different rangings north of the Wall. Later, during the Battle of Castle Black, when Mance Raider and his 100,000 strong wildling army would attack the Wall, Jon Snow would again prove his prowess. He took command of defenses atop the Wall and successfully held off the wildling army for seven straight days and nights. John was dashing, quick, fearless in battle, and very quick to take up the cause that he thought he believed in. During his tenure as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, John would go on to make many unpopular decisions amongst the rest of his brothers, in particular in regards to the wildlings and the treatment of the wildlings. John knew about the threat of the others, he knew the White Walkers were coming, and he knew he had to get the wildlings south of the wall, otherwise they would be added to the Army of the Dead. But some members of the Night's Watch just could not see this, and all they saw when they saw the wildlings were the enemy. And unfortunately, John would end up being betrayed by his own men and assassinated at the end of Book 5. Up next, we have Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, a.k.a. the Knight of Tears, was born in 136 AC in King's Landing and was the second son of King Viserys II. Aemon joined the King's Guard during the reign of his uncle, King Aegon III Targaryen, at the age of 17, and would eventually rise to become the Lord Commander of the King's Guard. 
Aemon would go on to serve in the King's Guard during the reign of four other Targaryen kings. He was referred to as the noblest knight who ever lived, and his skill with a sword was equally legendary. He died, saving the life of his brother, King Aegon IV. Even a hundred years after his death, Aemon remains a legendary figure among highborn and small folk alike, and is highly regarded as one of the best fighters to ever live. Up next, coming in at number 7, we have Gregor Clegane, a.k.a. The Mountain. Gregor was born in 265 AC and was the older brother of Sandor Clegane, a.k.a. The Hound. Gregor was freakishly large and often called the Mountain That Rides. He is well known for his size, cruelty, and his prowess in battle. He is close to 8 feet tall with massive arms and legs the size of tree trunks. Gregor would go on to pledge himself to House Lannister and would often be referred to as Tywin's Mad Attack Dog. He took part in the sack of King's Landing committing heinous acts including killing Elia Martell, the wife of Rhaegar Targaryen, and their children. Years later, Gregor also took part in the Great Joy Rebellion and was widely known to be one of the most formidable warriors in both combat and at tourneys. And he is certainly someone you do not want to let get a hold of you. And despite his size, he was fairly quick in combat, which only made him that much more formidable. The mix of Gregor's size and speed made him a very unique warrior, one that would not be matched for years to come. Up next, coming in at number 6, we have Robert Baratheon. Now, I know when most people think about Robert Baratheon, they think about the old, fat, witty king that we see on the show or that you read about in the books. But during Robert's rebellion, when he was in his youth, Robert was a much different figure, and he was very formidable in battle, and one of the most fierce warriors to ever swing a warhammer. Robert was born in 262 AC at Storm's End and was the eldest of three brothers, Robert, Renly, and Stannis. Robert spent most of his youth in the Vale of Arryn, where he met and befriended a young Ned Stark who was also stationed there. The two would go on to become the best of friends, and Robert would eventually fall in love with Ned Stark's sister, and they would both become betrothed. Later on, after the supposed kidnapping of Lyanna Stark at the hands of Rhaegar Targaryen, Robert and Ned would quickly call all of their banners and mount a rebellion against the House Targaryen. Robert and Ned would ride from town to town during the rebellion, liberating many different town folks from the yoke of the Mad King. Robert was described as strong as a bull and fearless in battle. He would go on to win the rebellion when he met Rhaegar Targaryen at the Battle of the Trident and the two of them fought in single combat, with Robert ultimately winning the fight when he landed a devastating blow to Rhaegar's chest, absolutely smashing all of the rubies he had in his armor. From that point on, the river would forever become known as the Ruby Ford. Coming in at number 5, we have Jaime Lannister, a.k.a. the Kingslayer. Jaime was born in 266 AC at Casterly Rock and was the eldest son of Tywin Lannister, the richest man in Westeros. At the age of 15, Jaime became the youngest knight of the King's Guard in the history of Westeros, which deeply angered his father Tywin as Jaime was set to be the heir of Casterly Rock. Jaime was a born warrior and took very little interest in politics or court intrigue. He's described as rash, headstrong, quick to anger, and with very little patience. He earned his Kingsguard cloak after taking part in the campaign against the Kingswood Brotherhood, where he saved Lord Sumner Crackhall and even crossed sword with the smiling knight himself. After the battle, Jaime was knighted by Sir Arthur Dane himself for his valor and prowess in battle. Jamie would go on to serve King Aerys for many years to come, winning many tourneys along the way, and would also go on to be one of the heroes at the Siege of Pike during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Then, years later, during Robert's Rebellion, when Tywin Lannister's army was at the gates, King Aerys ordered Jamie to bring him his father's head. Instead, Jamie turned on his king, killing King Aerys, earning the nickname the Kingslayer. Coming up next at number 4, we have the great John Umber. John Umber was the lord of the last hearth and the head of House Umber, who are one of the closest bannermen of House Stark. The great John is a massively imposing figure, nearly 7 feet tall and wider than even Hodor. His fists are said to be as large as hams. Jaime Lannister highly regards John Umber as one of the few men that could beat him in a fight. 
The great John is proud, boisterous, and fierce in battle, and wields a great sword that is larger than even ice, the Valerian steel ancestral sword of House Stark. After Ned Stark is imprisoned and Rob calls his bannermen to Winterfell, the Great John is among the first lords to question Rob's experience as a commander, especially when Rob orders the Umbers to march behind House Hornwood and House Corwin, which deeply angers the Great John, to the point where he even draws his own sword. But Rob quickly earns his respect as Greywin, Rob's wolf, jumps up and rips off two of the Great John's fingers, which the Great John ultimately laughed about. From that point on, the Great John would become Rob Stark's closest ally and his greatest champion. After Lord Eddard Stark is executed in King's Landing, it is the Great John who steps up and says that the North should rule themselves again, proclaiming Rob Stark the King of the North, at which point the rest of the Northern Lords quickly followed suit. Coming in at number three, we have Prince Oberyn Martell, the Red Viper of Dorne. Oberyn was born in 257 AC and was the second son of House Martell and had an older brother named Doran. Oberyn was a fierce warrior who was widely feared throughout Westeros. He had a notorious reputation and according to Tywin Lannister, Oberyn has always been a little bit half mad. Oberyn's brother describes him as deadly, dangerous, and very unpredictable, saying that no man dare tread on him. He's also described as rash, witty, sharp of tongue, and he spent years bloodthirsty for revenge after the murder of his sister Elia and her children at the hands of the mountain. Oberyn also had a fascination for poisons, learning much about the art after spending years at the Citadel and time in Essos, earning the nickname the Red Viper. Oberyn was known to coat his spear in manticore venom, making even the slightest cut from his blade deadly. During Tyrion Lannister's trial by combat, Oberyn Martell would quickly step up and become Tyrion's champion when he saw that Gregor Clegane was the champion of the crown. Oberyn saw this as his chance to finally get revenge for the death of his sister and her children. Oberyn would go on to dominate most of the fight, wounding and cutting Gregor Clegane several times before shoving his spear right through the mountain's gut. And instead of finishing off the mountain then and there, he foolishly tries to get in confession from the mountain before he dies. But since the mountain is no normal human being, he manages to get up the last bit of strength that he has, trips up Oberyn, and completely crushes his head in with his bare hands. Even though Oberyn is killed, he does end up getting some small measure of revenge, as the mountain would eventually later die a most agonizing death due to the manticore venom coated on Oberyn's blade. Coming in at number two, the second best overall fighter in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, we have Sir Barristan Selmy, a.k.a. Barristan the Bold. Barristan was born in 236 AC and was the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and one of the most celebrated knights in the history of Westeros. He is considered by many to be one of the most skilled and respected knights to ever live. During the War of the Nine Penny Kings, Barristan Selmy would go on to put an end to the final Blackfire Rebellion when he slew Maelys the Monstrous in single combat, which earned him fame and renown for many years to come. Barristan was named to the Kingsguard at the age of 23, giving up his family seat and the girl that he was betrothed to. He served in the Kingsguard throughout the reign of Jaehaerys II, Aerys II, and Robert Baratheon. In 277 AC, after King Aerys was captured and imprisoned at Duskendale, Tywin Lannister had planned to storm the city in hopes of recovering the king, when Barristan Selmy offered a different course of action. Disguised as a hooded beggar, Barristan would gain entry to the city by climbing the walls at night and single-handedly rescuing the king, cutting down century after century as he made his way to the dungeon. Then, on his way out, he made his way to the stables and quickly got King Aerys out of there, taking an arrow in the chest on his way out. Many stories and songs were written and sung of Barristan's deeds after Duskendale. Later, during Robert's Rebellion, Barristan fought for the House Targaryen, slaying dozens of enemies at the Battle of the Trident before getting wounded. Impressed by his skill and valor in battle, Robert Baratheon pardoned Barristan Selmy and kept him on as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. 
And coming in at number one, the best fighter in all of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, we have none other than Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. Arthur was born in 260 AC in Dorne to House Dane and was widely known as the greatest knight to ever live. He wielded a legendary sword, the most famous sword in all of Westeros as a matter of fact, Dawn, the ancestral sword of House Dane. It was said to be forged from the heart of a dying star and was said to be as sharp and strong as any Valerian steel. Author George R.R. R. Martin once stated that Arthur Dane and Barristan Selmy were very closely matched in skill, but said Arthur would ultimately win if he was wielding Dawn. Known as the Sword of the Morning, a title that is only bestowed to the greatest fighter in all of House Dane, Arthur would become known as the most deadliest member of King Aerys Kingsguard. When the Kingswood Brotherhood rose up, Arthur Dane was sent to deal with the threat, which he eventually did by slaying their leader, the Smiling Knight, in single combat. A deadly and infamous outlaw who was thought to be insane and was a very skilled swordsman himself. Then, later on, during Robert's Rebellion, Arthur was stationed at the Tower of Joy, where he was reportedly killed by Eddard Stark in combat, but the exact circumstances of his death are left a little bit hazy. Ned Stark considered Arthur the finest knight to ever had lived, and the best fighter to ever have lived, and stated that Arthur definitely would have killed him if not for Howland Reed. After his death, Eddard would return the sword Dawn to House Dane in Dorne, Sir Arthur is widely remembered as the most skilled fighter to ever have lived, and a true valiant knight. And he became a legendary hero for many years to come, with dozens of songs and stories written about him. And there we have it folks, my top 10 fighters in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. And now this list was incredibly tough to make, there are so many good fighters in George's story that you could easily swap out many of these fighters with some other ones that weren't mentioned. But I would love to know what your top 10 fighters are. Definitely let me know down in the comment section below. I love to see the differences. And as always, slap a like on this video before you leave. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. And we will see you on the next one.